In this lecture, we're going to look at two slightly more complicated examples involving separable differential equations. The first one is Torricelli's law. So this is an example from physics, and the setup is going to be we have a cylindrical tank of water. So let's go ahead and draw that. And there's actually going to be a hole in the bottom of this tank through, to, through which the water is leaking out. So let me draw the water. Maybe the, the tank is filled up to here at this particular moment in time. And the water is actually leaking out through this hole. So I'll draw that. Okay. And uh, we can define a few variables uh, associated with this problem. So, um, so I guess first we have the radius of the cylindrical tank. So that'll be, um, let's call that capital R. So it'll be R. Um, let's also uh, use let's use small r to indicate the radius of the hole. And um, what we want to be studying is how the height of the water in a tank is changing at any given time. So maybe we're initially filled to a height h0, and we want to study h of t, this function. Um, which is the height of the water at any time t. And h0 will indicate uh, the initial height. Okay, um, and the question we'd like to answer is, um, how long will it take uh, for the water to drain out completely? So ideally we'd like some expression in terms of maybe these variables, capital R, little r, and H0. And uh, as I alluded to, the relevant physical law here is called Torricelli's law. So what does Torricelli's law say? Um, well, it says that uh, the outflow velocity of the water, uh, say when, when uh, filled to a height h, um, that is is actually going to be equal to a different velocity. So it will actually be the velocity of a single drop of water starting up here at a height h and falling this distance. So it's actually equal to, uh, this is what Torricelli found. Um, sorry, so it's equal to the velocity of a single drop of water um, or say the velocity a single drop of water would attain by falling a height h. Okay. And that's this outflow velocity right here. So I'll just draw. So the water is coming out at a certain velocity. We can actually calculate that velocity by pretending that we just have a single drop of water up here that has fallen. Um, 
a height h and then measuring the velocity of that single drop of water. That's what Torricelli's law says. Okay, so um, how do we use this? So let's actually quickly do sort of a mini problem here. Let's figure out well, what if we have a drop of water that's at um, height h. And we're going to let this drop of water fall. So maybe it'll go there and then there and then there. So it's getting faster. It's picking up speed under gravity. And um, let's just try to calculate what this velocity is going to be. So um, we need to choose a coordinate system. That's the first thing we should do in these physical problems. So I'll actually um, let's set y equals 0 to be this position here. And this will be y equals h. And we want to study y of t, which is the, uh, yeah, the height of the, of the water droplet. We'll say this is a positive direction, because that's what we drew in. You could have done it the opposite way, the opposite way around, too. Um, so just remember, actually, so this is a totally different problem than this one we're starting with. Um, so that's what Torricelli's law says. You can basically turn this problem into a different problem if you want to calculate this velocity. So we're just considering the single drop of water, and that's what uh, and uh, y of t is measuring the position. And um, so what do we know? Well, we know that the acceleration. Uh, so the acceleration is just going to be the acceleration due to gravity. Because right, we just have a single drop of water um, that we're letting fall down under the influence of gravity. And so I can just write down my velocity function. Right? It's going to be, um, well, it will be the antiderivative of acceleration. So it'll be gt uh, plus c, but c will be the initial velocity. And I'm just, um, I'm dropping it from rest. So c will actually be zero. So we just have gt which is the uh, velocity function. We want to figure out what is the velocity here when we're at height h. So the only problem is we don't really know what value of t that corresponds to. So our strategy is going to be find a value of t that corresponds to the water droplet having fallen at height h, and then plug that into this formula. So we're also going to need a position. So y of t is going to be uh, the antiderivative of velocity, 1 half gt squared. Again, um, the initial position is 0 based on our coordinate system. So we don't, uh, so yeah, we have a plus c, but that c is going to be 0, it turns out. Um, OK, and so now what do we want? Um, like we said, we, we want uh, So we want to find uh, the value of t uh, when uh, y of t equals, equals uh, h. So we can plug that into our velocity formula. OK. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we'll just use this. Right? So we know that y of t is h. Now we want to solve this for t, so we get uh, t squared is 2h over g, which means that t is uh, the square root of 2h over g. So that's the time we want to plug into the velocity. So let's go ahead and do that. So v is going to equal g times this time, 2h over g, taking the square root. Um, and we can simplify this because we have g over the square root of g. That's g to the first power over g to the one-half power. So we just get g to the one-half power in the, in the uh, numerator. So square root of g. So we can put that inside the square root also. So we get 2hg uh, square root. So that's the velocity of a single drop of water falling at height h. So we've answered this, uh, this sort of mini problem here. OK. So. Let's actually go back to our original problem. We figured out what this v is. It's going to be the square root of 2 hg by Torricelli's law, right? Because that's the velocity of a single drop of water falling at height h. 
And um, we want to eventually understand h of t. That seems pretty hard to understand. Um, so as we've seen uh, several times so far, it's often easier to say something about the rate of change of a function like h of t. In other words, writing a differential equation for h of t. That's often easier to do than just trying to understand h of t itself. And then we can use that differential equation and solve it uh, in order to find h of t. So, um, so now our next question is, yeah, what is uh, dh dt? How is the height changing at any time? Okay. Um, well, what's causing the height to change is this water is leaking out, right? So we know that dhdt is going to be negative, right? Because this water is leaking out and no more water is coming in. Um, but it's a bit hard to actually write a differential equation for dhdt. Um, because when we're thinking about the water leaking out, that's more naturally translated into a volume, right? Because every, every little moment in time, we lose some volume of water. And then we can maybe relate that back to the height. Um, so I just want to point out, it's actually easier to write a differential equation for dv dt, where, where capital V is the volume. I guess I should try to distinguish this little v and the capital V. It's easier to write a differential equation for, um, for dv dt. And I want you to notice that this is good enough, because once we find a differential equation for dv dt, well, what is v? v uh, is pi times big R squared times h, so the volume for a cylinder. And so if we use the technique of changing variables that we talked about, take the time derivative of this equation, we get dv dt equals pi R squared times dh dt. So we can actually relate dh dt and dv dt. So we'll try to just write an equation for dv dt. I think that'll be a little bit easier. And then we'll use this, um, this relationship here to put it in terms of dhdt instead. Um, okay. Okay, but now we have to write a differential equation for dv dt. So we have to ask ourselves, how, um, how is the volume changing? Okay. Okay, so let's think about this. So again, we observe that the volume is, the only thing that's causing the volume to change is the water that's leaking out. So let's try to zoom in on that part of the picture there. So I'm just going to draw the very bottom of this tank. Okay. And we have this circular hole down here and the water is draining out of the circular hole. Okay. Okay, so um, here's what we can do. We can say um, over a short uh, time interval, let's say, so over a time interval, uh, delta T, let's call it, so it's a really short time interval. We've had a small amount of water that's leaked out. And let's actually give that a name. So let's call that um, delta Y. So this is uh, the change in the height. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the amount, uh, this is the distance that that water has traveled. And um, if we do a short enough time interval here, then we can actually say that delta y, we can just get that, so this is a distance, we can get that by multiplying the velocity times the time. So that's actually just going to be v times uh, delta t. And this is va um, valid for uh, delta t, very small. Technically, this is an approximation, right? Because we have these deltas. Um, okay, so yeah, the water is changing by this much in this amount of time, the, the, uh, 
the height of the water that's coming out here. And uh, you'll notice that this also is going to have the shape of a cylinder, if you kind of think about this closely. So there's a circular hole at the bottom. And so we have like a mini cylinder of water here that's fallen out over this time interval. And we can calculate the volume of that small cylinder. So, um, and we'll call that the change in the volume. Right. So what is the change in the volume? It's the volume of the cylinder. So what will that be? Well, let's remember that little r was the radius of that hole. Um, so it's going to be pi times little r squared times the height. Well, what's the height? The height is uh, delta y. All right. um, ah, and one other thing, because we're losing volume in the tank and we want the change in volume in the tank, well, we, we're going to need a minus sign here right, because we're losing volume. So the volume, the change in volume in a tank will actually be the volume of this cylinder, but with a minus sign because we just lost it. Um, okay. Um, I'll just point out one thing. So if you actually want to try to use uh, this uh, this differential equation that we're going to write uh, to to solve an actual problem, um, it's actually more accurate to do um, to do the following. So. Technically, what happens here is it's going to look more like this. So there's this hole that's maybe larger. And the surface tension of water is actually going to cause it to sort of go in a little bit like that. And so what, what it turns out is that the actual radius of this, of this uh, hole um, is not the radius of the cylinder. The radius of the cylinder turns out to be a little bit smaller. And so it's more accurate to actually say delta, delta V equals negative, and I'm going to multiply by this coefficient uh, alpha, and that's known as the uh, flow coefficient. And uh, for water, it's approximately 0 0.6. So if you actually want to solve a problem, uh, or do a demonstration uh, where you have a, a water draining out of a tank, you need to actually consider um, this fact. So we're actually going to have this, this flow coefficient in here. Um, okay, so let's continue. We've almost arrived at a differential equation. And why is that? So let me just write down what we have, which is delta V equals negative alpha, that's pi r squared, times delta y. How about, wait a second, what is delta y? Delta y is approximately uh, v times delta t. So let me just write that down. Okay. And then if I divide by delta t, I get delta v over delta t. Well, that's... Uh, Technically, yeah, it's approximately equal to negative alpha times pi times little r squared um, times v. Right. Great. Okay. Um, so what can we do now? Well, we have delta v over delta t. We want dv over dt. So how do you go from delta V over delta T to DV DT? You take a limit. So you take the limit as delta T gets very small. And then that turns into DV DT. So DV DT is negative alpha times pi times little r squared times the velocity. And let's also remember that we know what the velocity is. That's what we figured out here. Right? The velocity is the square root of 2 times h times g. Okay, and then finally, let's recall that we can actually write 
this in terms of DHDT instead of DVDT, which will be great because we see the variable H appearing over here. Okay, so uh, DVDT, I'm just going to replace that with uh, what we have up here, pi times capital R squared times DHDT. That's going to equal negative alpha times pi times little r squared times the square root of 2hg. Okay, and we finally have a differential equation that we can solve for this function h of t. So that was quite a lot of work to, to get this differential equation. But we have a differential equation now. Let me just rewrite it so we just have the dh dt here. So I have pi on both sides. Um, and then on this side, I'm going to have what I'll have negative alpha times little r squared, and I'll be dividing by big R squared. And I have times um, square root of 2hg. So maybe what I'll do is I'll separate the h out. So I have square root of 2g times square root of h. And you might notice that this whole thing right here is just going to be a constant, actually. So this is a constant. So let's just call this Let's call this um, K. Okay. Um, you also might have noticed that this differential equation is one that we studied. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a kind that we studied. This is separable. So let's see if we can solve this differential equation. Um, so first I'll rewrite it so that we're just making reference to this k, and we'll remember what k is. It's, it's this whole thing here. So you have negative k times the square root of h. Okay, uh, let's separate variables. So we'll divide by uh, square root of h times dh equals negative k times dt. And what next? Uh, we integrate both sides. So what is the integral of 1 over square root of h? So let's just, let's just look at that really quick. Well, square root is a 1 half power, and we have it in the denominator. So what we're really looking at here is h to the negative 1 half power. OK. Uh, so what is that integral going to be? Well, it'll be, so the power will be 1 larger, right? So we have h to the 1 half. But then what do we need out front? We need a 2 in order to cancel this 1 half. Like if we take the derivative of this, um, that 1 half will come down. So we'll need this 2 to cancel out. And then we'll get h to the negative 1 half like we want. So let's write that. So the antiderivative of h, uh, 1 over square root of h is going to be 2 times h to the 1 half, which is square root of h. And on this side, we get negative kt plus c. Um, what is c? So let's find c. Let's recall that, um, yeah, what, what is the initial height? So what is h of 0? Do we have an initial condition? Well, I think we were just calling the initial height uh, h0. H so we'll just use the variable h0. And that's fine. We can still plug this in, right? So, so I get um, two times the square root of h uh, h zero. Actually, you know what I should do? I'll uh, I'll go ahead and just completely solve for h first. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we didn't finish explicitly solving this for h. So square root of h equals uh, negative uh, k over two times t plus c. We might as well just call that c again. And now let's find c. So, uh, or sorry, one more step, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. What is the function h of t? It's the square of this. Okay. Now we'll plug in this initial condition. So what happens when we do that? We get h, uh, h0 equals, this becomes 0, right? Because t is 0. So we just get h0 is, um, is c squared. Um, we want to find c, so c is the square root of h0, and 
we can plug this back into our formula. So what is our, um, let's, let's just write out our, our solution. So here's our solution. Well, it's this, and, we, and then we, uh, we plug in square root of h0 for c. So you have negative k over 2 times t plus uh, the square root of h0, square root of the initial height, and then we're going to square it. Um, great. So this is um, the function that measures the height of the water at any time. So we didn't actually finish the problem completely because we actually want to know how long, like what, what amount of time will it take for the water to drain out completely. So I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to give you a short problem. So this will not be, um, this will not be long because we already did most of the work. We got this equation. So um, what I'd like you to do is just, yeah, find uh, how long will it take the tank to drain out completely using our solution here. Completely, yep. Okay. So we need to figure out what to plug into this and um, and uh, yes, yeah, so notice that actually, how long will it take to drain out completely? Um, so let's say that, that, that will involve several of these constants. So find an expression for the time involving, well, what constants might that involve? Okay, uh, so we'll have, um, well, remember what k is, right? So you'll plug this back in for k at some point. So we have alpha, we have little r, we have capital R, we have uh, h0, and we have uh, g. So we have a lot of constants that this expression could involve. Great, so go ahead and uh, pause the video, try that problem, and then we'll go to our second example. Okay. So our second example is, uh, is going to be called Lanchester's Law. Okay. And uh, Lanchester's Law is actually not from physics. It's from uh, something very different. It's from military strategy. Military strategy. Um, so here's the setup for Lanchester's Law. Okay. Um, so we, we're going to have actually two armies. So we'll have Army A. And we'll have Army uh, B. Okay. So Army A. What are we going to have here? Um, let's just draw some number of units and then army B. So we're going to have some other number of units here. So we'll draw this one in blue. Maybe it, maybe it has fewer units than army A. And so let's actually define some, some variables. So we'll have both the number of units in each army. So we'll call, we'll actually just call that capital A for, for number of units in army A and capital B for number of units in capital in, uh, army B. And then we'll actually make this a little bit more complicated. So let's introduce another parameter and we'll call it the skill level. And for army A, uh, I'll use the uh, Greek letter alpha and for army B, I'll use the letter beta. And that's just going to indicate how skilled these armies are. So for example, um, if this number alpha is twice uh, this number beta, that's sort of indicating that army A is twice, uh, each one unit of army A is twice as good at fighting uh, than each one unit of army B. Uh, so this is sort of a skill level. And, um, and what, what Lanchester did is he, he came up with a differential equation to try to model um, a battle between these two armies. And so army A, 
Um, what can we say about its rate of change? So it's going to actually lose units um, at a rate, but we're always trying to, to say like, what this rate is. Usually we're trying to say what this rate is proportional to. So how fast is army A going to lose units? So it loses them at a rate proportional to. Well, what should it be proportional to? It should basically be proportional to the strength of army B, right? So if army B is stronger, if it has many more units, then army A is going to be losing units at that rate. Um, so let's write that down. So um, at a rate proportional to yeah, the number number of units that the opposing army has that uh, army B has. And, uh, and what we can actually do in this case is we can say what that constant proportionality will be. That should just be the skill level, right? So has, um, so with constant of proportionality, Um, beta, right? So if they're twice as skilled, then they're gonna then they're gonna be twice as, uh, as good in battle. So army is gonna be losing units twice as fast. Uh, so what we can do is we can immediately write down a differential equation. So what is dadt going to be? Well, we just said it in words, right? So it's going to lose units at a rate proportional to uh, the number of units that B has, which is capital B, but we know the constant proportionality is just going to be this skill coefficient here. Okay. Um, and I should say, this is also going to be happening in the, in the opposite direction. So we can also say that dBdt is going to be negative alpha times capital A. Right. The rate of change of this army is going to be based on you know, both the number of units in this army and their skill level. So skill level is something that's staying fixed. Number of units is something that's changing with time. So we're making reference back to this variable A. Okay. So what do we just write down? We wrote down actually a system of differential equations. So a system of differential equations. Uh, differential equations. And we're actually not going to study systems in any kind of detail in this course. Um, but we're, we're going to look at this one because what we can do is actually immediately turn this one into a single first order differential equation. And that's because if we divide these two, so if I do D, uh, let's do DB over DT divided by DA over DT. Well, okay, what's that? That's uh, the negatives will cancel. So I get alpha times A over beta times B. Notice the reverse order, right? I get the A on the top and the B on the bottom. Uh, but what is this DB over T, DT divided by DA over DT? That's just DB over DA. So we can eliminate the, the, variable, the variable T. Um, and so if you're... If you're at all confused about this, it's essentially the chain rule. So um, let me see if I can write this out a little differently. Um, so it's, um, yeah, uh, dBdt, uh, you can get by doing dBda, right, times dadt. And that's literally the chain rule. So what is this? This is just dividing both sides by dadt. And then, so dBdt over dADt is dB over dA, and that's our expression. So we're actually thinking of, so we're thinking of B as a function of A. So this battle is still taking place over time, but if I tell you how many units army A has at any time, then this function will give you how many units army B has at that time. Um, okay. So uh, now what? This is this is again 
a separable differential equation. So let's just write this out more clearly. So we have dBdA equals alpha over beta times uh, capital A over capital B. Let's separate variables. So we'll multiply by beta times B. And we have beta times B dB equals alpha times A dA. And then we will integrate both sides. And what do we get? So on this side, we get, uh, we get a 1 half b squared. That beta is just a constant. And on this side, we have a 1 half um, alpha times a squared. And then we'll add our arbitrary constant over here on the, on the, uh, the right side. And let's, uh, let's multiply through that at 1 half just to make it look a little nicer. And we'll replace the 2c that we get by this c. Um, okay, so we basically have this uh, solution. We could solve this for b, or we could solve this for a if we want. Um, this is the solution to the differential equation. I've wrote it in an um, implicit form here, and right? I haven't yet solved for b or a. Because I just want to think about what these look, what this looks like. So um, just go, kind of go up here. Um, I'm actually going to rewrite like this. So beta b squared minus alpha a squared equals a constant. Okay. What is that that I just wrote down? What would that look like if we graphed it? Um, so let's draw a little graph of this. Well, actually, what I wrote down is infinitely many functions, right? Um, because C could take on any value. So I'll do the A axis here and the B axis here. And these are hyperbolas, right? Um, so these are going to be hyperbolas. So let me draw what some of these hyperbolas might look like. Um, so one of them might kind of look like that. Um, one of them might look like that. Uh, one of them actually might look like that. And then we might have some that go this way instead. Okay, so this is a hyperbola. And each value of C that I can pick will correspond to a different curve on here. Okay, so I just wanna really quickly try to figure out what's going on here with this equation. So what do these hyperbolas mean? So let's suppose we start right here. And so actually what we have is we have a starting number of units of B and a starting number of units of A. And we know that the, the, the number of units for both armies are decreasing over time, right? So if we look at this over time, what's happening is this red dot is actually moving this way in a decreasing direction. So both B and A are decreasing. So if I look at what's happening over time, this red point is actually going to move here until it gets to here. And what does it mean when we get there? Well, um, we'll notice that actually A is at zero there and B is greater than zero. Okay, so what does that mean in real life? Right? That means that army B was victorious, right? So army B defeated army A. So B is victorious. Okay. Um, okay, so now I wanna tell you about, you know, what Lanchester's big discovery was. Um, it has to do with this differential equation. So I'm actually gonna give this as a problem. So I'd like you to think through it and then I'll, um, I'll go on to explain uh, how, to, how to solve this problem. But I'd like to give you a chance to think through this first. Um, so let's suppose that um, army B starts with, um, it's gonna start with more units than army A. Let's suppose it actually starts with K times as many units. as um, A, okay? So in other words, <laughs> what are we actually saying? 
how do we how do you, how do you turn that into a mathematical statement? So what we're saying is that the number of units of B when um, army A has, let's say, let's just call that A0. So that's the initial number of units of army A. Remember, B is a function of A, so we eliminated T. Um, so how many units does army B have? It has K times as many. Okay, so that's how we can turn that into an initial condition. Okay. Right, so uh, army B is starting with K times as many units as army A, and here's what I want to know. I want to know... Um, how many times more skilled uh, does army A have to be in order to compensate? Okay. How many times more skilled does army A have to be in order to compensate? Because if they had the same skill level, army B is starting with more units. So army B would just automatically win. Um, okay, so, and what do I mean by how many times more skilled? I mean, how many times is this number greater than that number? All right. So I'm actually gonna give you a chance to think about this for a second. This is kind of a tricky problem. Um, but, uh, so yeah, pause the video and then, um, in a few seconds, I'll explain how to do this. Okay. Um, so hopefully you had a chance to think through this. So, um, definitely the first thing we should do is use this initial condition to pin down the value of C here. All right. So I'm going to use the initial condition. So let's use... Um, this k times a zero. So again, yeah, what 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 am I doing here? I'm plugging in a zero for for a, and then k times a zero for b. Um, okay, so what do we get? We get beta times. I'm plugging in k times a zero, but I'm squaring that, so I get k squared times a zero squared, and that's going to equal alpha times a zero squared plus c. What does that tell me? That tells me that C equals um, beta k squared alpha zero minus alpha, um, sorry, there should be a square there, minus alpha a zero squared. Great, so before we do anything, let's just plug that in for C. So we have beta b squared equals alpha a squared plus um, beta k squared alpha zero, or sorry, a zero squared uh, minus alpha times a zero squared. So kind of a nasty constant there, but that's just a constant. Um, and these are, are um, we're trying to solve for beta as a function of alpha, let's say. Um, but what do we really want? We want to figure out how many times more skilled does army A have to be in order to compensate. So what do we need, what do we mean exactly by this? Well, as we said, um, if there were, if army A were not more skilled, right, then army B would just win. So it would be something like this, right? Or army A would just be, uh, would end up with zero units and B would have more than zero units. So what do we mean by, um, in order to compensate, we mean that basically, um, by the time uh, army A gets to zero units, we also want army B to get to zero units. So we want the outcome of the battle to, to be even, essentially. Does that make sense? So we want, we want A and B to reach zero simultaneously. Okay. So in other words, I'm plugging in zero for B and I'm plugging in zero for A at the same time. Okay, so when A is zero, B is also zero. And what do I get? Um, I get zero equals beta um, K squared times alpha uh, A zero squared minus alpha times A zero squared. Let's factor out the uh, 
um, the alpha, the a0. In fact, you know, we can even divide by that um, because it's a constant. So we actually just get beta times k squared minus alpha equals zero. But what does that tell me? That tells me that alpha is uh, k squared times beta. I'm going to circle that or box that. So why am I boxing that? Well, because uh, this tells us exactly what we need. So this is saying that the skill level of army A, that's what alpha represents, is k squared times the skill level of army B. So notice the square in there. That's kind of interesting. Right? Because B only started with k times as many units as A. Um, but apparently, in order to compensate for that, we actually need the skill level A to be k squared times that of B. Um, so that's really interesting. And this is... Um, this is, uh, this is called Lanchester's square law. That's sometimes what this differential equation is called. Lanchester's square law. And it's essentially saying this. So if army B starts with K times as many units as A, then uh, A needs to be K squared times as skilled. Um, so yeah, I, I just find this a really interesting application. And this, this has actually been uh, military historians have tried to use this to sort of explain uh, the results of some famous battles uh, in the past. Um, so that's Lanchester's Square Law, and um, that'll be it for today's lecture.